Well, I want to begin by saying, you know, normally we don't mind if you take a little siesta in the middle of my sermon. It's called Sabbath rest, after all. But you had an extra hour of sleep. So, no napping this morning. Okay? No napping. Who are the saints? There are a lot of different definitions. I'd like to ask you, thinking of that question, who is the one person or a small group of people who have been most influential in your spiritual journey to help you understand the things of God? Who has been most profound in helping you understand Jesus Christ and His grace that is for you? I would say they're a saint. The word literally in the scripture means holy one. God's people. The Lord's people. The faithful. The word in Greek is hagioi, and it's derived from the same root word that describes the Holy Spirit. So we could say it's those who have the Holy Spirit. There's a great verse in the book of Ephesians, excuse me, Philippians, chapter 2, which says, Shine like stars in the sky in a warped, crooked generation, holding fast the word of life. So there's something about those who have the Spirit within that are compelled, invited by God, empowered by God, to shine with a capacity that doesn't resonate inside ourselves, but in fact comes to us from God's presence dwelling within us. And then calls for us to be a light shining in a dark place. We might say it's the faithful departed. In fact, that's usually how we talk about the faithful. It's those who have gone on before us. Like the phrase, sailing off into the sunset. You know, we say goodbye to those who breathe their last in this world and they kind of go away from us almost like a ship sailing off toward a horizon. Smaller and smaller and smaller until our eyes can't see them at all anymore. But if we believe the promise of God that they are not dead but alive in a different place, that means that as we see them go away from us into the sunset, on the other side of glory, where God has already transformed all things to be new in eternity, there's a group of people in heaven welcoming them, saying, here she comes. They're seeing that person come to them like a ship coming into port. They're still alive, but in a different place. If you're a football fan, maybe you'd say the saints are the Hudak nation. Huh? How many of you like to watch pro football? All right. So maybe they're the Hudak nation. I don't think so. Not even. It says in the scriptures, though, that in faith in Jesus Christ, the truth is that saints have a divided heart. That Luther talked often about us being simultaneously saint and sinner. And that the reality is that the presence of the Spirit within us is a gift that God gives to indwell us, not because it's behavior that we're so flawless or so wonderful in all dimensions of our life, though you and I might be able to name a number of people that we would call saintly, but that in fact it is a declared righteousness. Like Jesus dressing us in a white robe. It's a declared righteousness where by faith, our faith in Jesus' death and resurrection, God looks at you and I and says, you belong to me. You're my child. You're a part of my people. And therefore, you are a saint. So I want you to think about that. I want you to think about the truth that I may in fact need by God's Spirit's power to become more and more like Christ 
more saintly. I am by God's declaration of promise already a saint. Already dwelt within by the Holy Spirit. So let's take a look again at this passage in Revelation. And I want to quickly name five things. Five things that we learn about the saints in this passage in Revelation. The first is that we are world citizens. I don't know if you caught it when I read it from Revelation 7, starting with verse 9, but it says that there was a group of people, a multitude of people that no one can count. It reminds me of the promise that God made to Abraham. Do you remember the story? How Abraham was doubting that God, in fact, would give him a child through his wife. Sarah, who was barren. And so he takes him out under the stars at night and says, look up into the stars, Abraham, and believe that I am. No one can count the stars, can they? It reminds me, therefore, this vision of the end of time in heaven that God will be faithful to his word. And that what, in fact, God is in the business of making happen in the world is the fulfillment of of every promise he's made. There's a multitude of saints, more than can be counted in heaven. But then it goes on and says, people of every nation and language and culture and tribe. My dad's mom immigrated from Norway when she was 18. She could speak only Norwegian when she came. And in her 80s and even into her 90s as she lived independently, with a twinkle in her eye, she would say, God understands Norwegian best. <laughs> but when we had devotions together, she would say, Lee, you'll have to excuse me because I have to pray in my heart language. And she would say, Chara, Yezu. And then the prayer I couldn't understand that God did it for us. Here's what I want you to think about. We are world citizens as saints, world people of God. And if you think that everybody in heaven is going to look like you, think like you, talk like you, enjoy the same food you do, hang out in the same places you do, your vision of God is too small. God so loved the world that he gave his only son. The second thing I want us to know about saints is that they've all washed themselves in the blood of Jesus Christ. It's kind of a paradox, isn't it, that you would get clean or white or pure by being in blood? And maybe uh, the, the analogy of the spiritual truth is hard for us to grasp or put our minds around. Last Thursday evening, Denise and I were enjoying supper at her house, and she'd made a pot of homemade soup. And we're going to go and watch a program in our den where the television is while we were eating supper. So I put a sandwich on my plate. I put a full bowl of homemade soup, tomato-based soup. You know what's coming? <laughs> and I'm coming through the doorway into the den, and my left elbow catches the door jam, and my plate and the bowl of soup launch about five feet, land in the front hallway where there's carpet, and I can't believe it. It hits the ground that, yes, there's soup all over the carpet, but it's like somebody shot it up. There's homemade soup on the soup. There's homemade soup on the wall. Everywhere. Stained. So we got to clean her out and we scrubbed it up. And about three hours later, my wife let me eat supper. <laughs> you and I have also too small an understanding of how pervasive sin is in affecting our spiritual soul. It gets everywhere. It's not just in our deeds, our actions. It's in our attitudes. It's in our motivations. It's in the direction of our life. 
It's in our priorities. And I do need Jesus. Clean me up. I need him to wash me. What's beautiful is that the Lord of Lords kneels before us and says, I'm going to scrub you up. He's not upset about it. In fact, he kind of likes cleaning your life. So all of us, in a sense, are prodigals who have, like the words of the hymn, prone to wander, Lord, I feel it, prone to leave the God I love, who need, at some point, to have the light come on and before the Lord Jesus confess our sinfulness and ask Him for forgiveness. And then that becomes, by faith, the rhythm of our faith journey. It's not a one-time deal. It's a daily confession and asking of forgiveness and a daily asking that Jesus' Spirit would wash us and make us clean. The third thing that the saints know is that we will worship around the throne. That's what it says. No matter how chaotic or oppressive or difficult or suffering your journey of life, I want you to know that the vision is that the saints worship around the throne, and no matter how difficult your life, God is always true, still on the throne. God is still in charge. On the throne. How many of you remember uh, the story of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden and what we always call the fall? Remember? Okay. Hang with me. Some of you look like your eyes are fading. <laughs> <laughs> and usually if we say that somebody does wrong, we say they fell into sin, correct? The direction is down. But what it says in Revelation is that the saints around the throne fall down to worship. Do you remember the phrase of the temptation of Satan to Eve? when he says, God's holding out on you. For he knows that you would like to be like God. So I want to suggest that at the root of our heart of sinfulness is not a downward fall, but an upward fall. An upward fall in the sense that we push God off his rightful throne as the ruler of our life. And then we say, I am the master of my life. I am the captain of my ship. I'm in charge. And that the defiance in rebellion against God's right to be God is the fundamental rebellion that leads to all other expressions of sin. We fall up. So worship around the throne, what do we do? We fall down before the Lord. And we again allow the Lord in our worship to have his rightful place in our life. Fourth, the saints wait with longing for Jesus to restore all of creation. That's when we read from, well, as Barb read from the Beatitudes for us, there is in the verbiage there an expression of the human longing for for the things of the reign of God to be ushered in. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comfortable. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be satisfied. The truth is that when Jesus went to the cross and was raised from the dead, He became the fulfillment in His victory to allow the restoration of the created order to because of Jesus, all of the created order can be restored. And someday He will come again and restore all the created order. But we as the saints then become the holders of hope. For we are looking for how the Spirit is at work in our world as we wait expectantly for God to restore. And He will. Lastly, five, 
is that we who are saints are to be the wow factor in culture. We are to be allowing the presence of Jesus to transform us to Christ-likeness so that we are distinctive in culture. The struggle for Protestant and Catholic Christians in Western Hemisphere culture is that there's very little distinctiveness from those who confess the name of Jesus and those who live as if there is no God. We've lost our distinctiveness. We've lost our shine. We've lost the Christ-likeness that has the hope of the grace of Jesus Christ emanating from our lives. I like what Elizabeth Kubler Ross writes. She said, people are like stained glass. They sparkle and shine when the sun is out, but true beauty is revealed only if there's light within. There was a nine-year-old boy who went with his parents to Europe. It's a true story. And in Europe, he, with his parents, visited all the great cathedrals along the way where their trip took them. And he would go into those ancient, gorgeous cathedrals, and he would see the light coming through the stained glass. And he would say to his dad, who's that? Well, that's St. Peter. Who's that? Well, that's St. Luke. Who's that? That's St. Francis. So you saw these beautiful images of the light shining through. So when they came back from Europe and they worshipped at their own home church again, the pastor invited the children up for the children's message, and the pastor said on All Saints Sunday, who are the saints? You know what that boy said? The boy raised his hand and he said, they're the ones that let the sun's light shine through. <laughs> and I want to know if the world sees the vivid colors of the presence of Jesus in the way that you carry yourself as a man or woman of faith. For you are declared saints, but now have you invited that the Spirit would be at work within you so that the love of Jesus emanates from your life. Does the love of Jesus shine through you? You've heard the phrase, better to light one candle than curse the darkness. We do not receive the promise of Jesus so that we can just hang out, biding our time, and coming together once a week to pat ourselves on the back and say, hey, it's good we're going to be up there together someday. Our mission as the saints of God is to shine like stars in the sky shine with the love of Jesus. Because we're the caretakers of hope that there is a God who loves us all, whose presence pulsates in our world, and who is someday not only going to forgive us, but who's going to restore the whole of the created world. Isn't that awesome? You are the saints of God. Shine like the saints. Thank you.